الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله الله سبحانه وتعالى he revealed this great religion to us from day 1 from the time of Adam alayhi salam Allah has been sending his messengers and prophets and his guidance for as a mercy for mankind not only did Allah send this guidance but Allah also protected this guidance so in the beginning there used to be prophets coming one after the other then with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the last of the prophets there was going to be no more messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who then were going to be those great people who will preserve the religion of Allah for all of us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed in the Quran when Allah said inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun indeed it is us who has revealed the message the reminder and indeed we will safeguard it and this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accomplished that in so many ways as we look at the life of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah his life and his brilliance we see a testimony in his life to the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards this ummah the protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the message that he sent for this ummah the life and brilliance of Imam al-Shafi'i is a documentary and an inspiration of the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his care and mercy and love for this ummah and the message he sent Imam Ahmad rahimahullah he said something which is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also informed us earlier imam ahmed said something that shows the greatness of what imam al-shafi'i rahimahullah did imam ahmed ibn hanbal the fourth of the great four imams of fiqh he said inna allah yuqayyidu lin nas fi ra'si kulli mi'atin man yu'allimuhum as-sunan wa yanfi 'an rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam al-kadhib قال فنظرنا فاذا في راس المئه عمر بن عبد العزيز وفي راس وفي راس المئتين الشافعي امام احمد رحمه الله said indeed allah has sent forth indeed allah sets forth four people at the head of each century someone a mujaddid who will teach them the sunnah the path of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when we can when we considered we found at the head of the first century it was umar ibn abdul aziz and at the head of the second century it was al shafi'i rahimahullah imam ahmad rahimahullah is showing to us what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that indeed allah will send forth inna allah yab'athu li hadhihi al ummah indeed allah will dispatch for this ummah على رأس كل مئة at the head of every hundred or so hundred years من يجدد لها دينها those or some who will renew for them their religion whenever the Muslim ummah tends to go away from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa taala Allah will bring those people those great people the mujaddid those the renewers who will renew in the ummah their devotion to the guidance of Allah turning to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Imam Ahmad says when we looked at the head of the first century we found that it was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz the great the first reviver of the religion of Islam and then he said when we looked at the second century we found that it was Ash-Shafi'i Muhammad ibn Idris Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah the second mujaddid the renewer of the Islam of the early Islam let us look today at the life and brilliance of Imam Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah we'll begin by looking at that great role that Imam Ash-Shafi'i performed which made him be known by the scholars of the Muslim ummah as the second mujaddid the second reviver of Islam after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz we will look at the role that he performed slowly and slowly but let us appreciate in the beginning that Imam Ash-Shafi'i as a mujaddid he performed a role with the Muslim ummah at that time in the second century at the end of 200 Hijri the Muslim ummah when Allah when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had set the Muslims on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as before he died 
we find that at the end of the 200 Hijri, the Muslim Ummah, it was set to split apart. The Muslim Ummah was, was set to split apart onto two directions. What were those two directions? One was the direction of the Dalun, and the other was the direction of the Maghdubi alayhim. One was the direction of those who were the followers, like it happened to the followers of Prophet Musa alayhi salam before, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them the religion. So they set upon that religion. Then they deviated from that path. That was the path of the Maghdubi alayhim, the ones on whom was the, was the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they had the guidance, but then they left the guidance. The other, the opposite end was the, was the way of the Dalin. Those who were given the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the followers of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, they were given the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they lost that guidance and they were becoming misguided. These were the Dalin, the, the ones who went astray. At that time, the Muslim Ummah was set for a course where the Muslim Ummah was going to split apart into two. One going to this course, the other going to that course. It was at that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this man, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, the second Mujaddid in the history of Islam. Let us look at that great work that he did because that instills in us a sense of confidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always will always protect and safeguard the mercy that he has sent for mankind, the guidance of the religion of Islam, the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we look now, I will leave the details of the work that Imam Shafi'i did for the later on when we come to it. Let us now go back to look at the beginnings, the humble beginnings of this little boy, Al Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris. Let us look at his humble beginning when none of us would have predicted that this man, Allah had chosen him, Allah had set him forth for this great task. But it will help us to appreciate that no matter what the challenges are facing the Muslim Ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though we do not realize, even though we do not perceive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan whereby He is preparing those people who are the renewers, the mujaddideen of this ummah. Let us look at the beginnings, the humble beginnings in the desert of Arabia of this boy, Muhammad. Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i, Imam al Shafi'i, Abu Abdullah. He was born in the city of Al Ghazza in Palestine. He was born in the city of Al Ghazza in Palestine and we all hear of Palestine in the news today. Imam al-Shafi'i was born to a father who was from the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the noble tribe of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quraysh, about whom we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he looked at the best of the people, the most noble, and that was the tribe of the Quraysh. And from amongst them, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose the best amongst them, which was Muhammad as their Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From this tribe was born Muhammad ibn Idris, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. He, as I said, he was born in Gaza as a little baby, about the time that he was born. About the time that he was born, his father had died. He, Imam al-Shafi'i came into this world. As a toddler, as an infant, he was an orphan. He was an orphan. Who was the one who brought him up? It was his mother. It was his mother. She was from Yemen and another Arab as well. She brought up this baby who was to go on to become the, mujad, the second mujaddid in the history of Islam. Let us look at the important role the mom played. And that shows to us the important duty that a mother, that a Muslim woman can play in bringing about the reform of the Muslim Ummah. The mother of Imam al-Shafi'i, when Imam al-Shafi'i was a little baby, she realized that if he had grown in Gaza, he would have been far away from his ancestry, from the nobility of his family, from being in the tribe of Quraysh. So what she did, she took that important decision to take Imam al-Shafi'i, her little baby, to take him back to her place of, uh, back to his place of ancestry, which is in the city of the, where the Prophet ﷺ was born, to Mecca. So she decided to take the little baby and migrate back to Mecca so that he could be raised in the tribe of Quraysh with its nobility and great behavior that they were known for and the character. Thus, by the age of two, the mother of Imam al-Shafi'i, she brought the baby to Mecca. 
and thereby he grew in the desert in the heart of Arabia where Prophet Muhammad sallallahu grew in the same place grew the second mujaddid of Islam Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah as we see this we see that it was nobody who wrote the life of Imam Shafi'i so greatly except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who designed the life of Imam Shafi'i to go on to become that great mujaddid at the age of two he finds himself in an upbringing like the upbringing of the messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Mecca Imam Shafi'i he finds himself in the beginning he finds himself in the beginning taking a liking to archery taking a liking to archery and mind you as you know archery is something that is encouraged in Islam for the good that it does in preparing the Muslim youth to protect the future of the religion of the community Imam Shafi'i from a young age he took a liking to the archery and they say he became so good at archery that for every 10 shots he would do 9 out of 10 he would score a bullseye this is how good he was this is how good he was in his, in his concentration and in his ability to strike the target in whatever he did. With this upbringing, people knew him for the greatness that he had even in archery. But there at that time, Allah had more in store and planned for Imam Shafi'i than just excelling in archery or sport or etc. like that. So Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, he mixed with the tribes of Arabs in the deserts of Arabia around Mecca. From a young age, he grew up amongst the Arab tribes and by that time when the Muslim world had begun to expand to beyond the Arab world, the people in the cities, they tended to have their language mixed up a little bit. Whereas the people in the desert, they were the ones who were closest to the pure, strong Arabic language. Imam Shafi'i in the deserts of Mecca, he mixed with these people. He learned the Arabic language in its purity and then he went on to become one of the Afsahun Nas, one of the best people in Arabic language. And can you imagine this would have been a, one of the integral part to making him one of the greatest scholars of all time. Because for you to excel as a scholar of Islam, you need to know the Arabic language. Imam Shafi'i, not only did he know the Arabic language, he was one of the greatest of Arabic language as the scholars bore testimony at that time. It was not only the Arabic, nor his greatness in shooting and arrows, that was what made him so great. But from a young age, like the other great scholars of Islam, from a young age, Imam Shafi'i, he memorized the Quran while he was still a little boy. And can you imagine the role that his mom played? He was only an orphan. In fact, Imam Shafi'i says he did, his mother did not even have enough money to pay for Imam Shafi'i to go and learn about Islam from the scholars. She did not even have enough money to pay for the education of Imam Shafi'i. But Imam Shafi'i related that Imam Shafi'i related that his teacher, his teacher made a deal with Imam Shafi'i as a, as a boy growing up. When he saw the greatness in him, his teacher made a deal that you, you, I will teach you. And in return, given that you cannot pay for it, in return, you look after my children when I'm busy with other things. You look after my kids when I'm away. So Imam Shafi'i made that deal. And with that deal, he learned from his teacher. He benefited from his teacher, although he, his mother could not pay for it. And in exchange, he did some work for his teacher. And this is how he went on to learn. By having memorized Quran, by having learned Arabic language so, so greatly, as a boy, about the age of our little Muslim boys here, he memorized the Quran, learned Arabic. He went on to learn from the best of the scholars in Mecca. And Mecca had some of the best, one of the greatest scholars of all time. His name was Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah. He was a person of Mecca and from him Imam Shafi'i learned as a little boy growing up. To the extent that by the age of 15, having learned from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of the greatest Imams of Muslims of all time, and by the then Mufti of Mecca, having learned from all these various scholars by the age of 15, by the age of 15, Imam Shafi'i became qualified to be a mufti. He became qualified to be a mufti who is a scholar, qualified and capable of giving fatawi to the people. Can you imagine? He started young. 
His mother, with his uh, sincerity, cared about the Islam of the boy, brought him to Mecca, let him learn from the scholars of that time to the extent by the age of 15, the Imam al-Shafi was so sharp and so gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he became a mufti. But we can see that Allah had in store. Allah was preparing this boy to lead a role of being the second mujaddid in the history of Islam. And this shows to us how we might not realize that far away in the deserts of the Muslim world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might be raising a boy who goes on to become a mujaddid, a savior of the spirit of Islam. Imam al-Shafi, after that, he continued to excel in knowledge and he heard about a scholar who was in Medina at that time. Remember Imam al-Shafi'i was born in 150 Hijri and died in 204 Hijri. He was born in 150 Hijri. By the time he was about in his early 20s, he wanted to go and learn from the one, perhaps the most renowned scholars of the Muslim of that time. There was a scholar who is known as Imam Darul Hijra, the Imam of the home of Hijra of the Prophet Sallallahu and that was none less than Imam Malik ibn Anas Rahimahullah, the one whose biography we looked at last time. Imam Malik Rahimahullah, the scholar of Medina, by that time, in his late age, by that time he had become perhaps the most popular of the Muslim scholars in the whole of the Muslim world, stretching all the way from Spain all the way from Spain to Morocco, North Africa, Middle East, to the, for the, to the Middle Asian countries, as well as going towards India. All of these countries, perhaps the most renowned and greatest and famous of the scholars of that time was Imam Malik ibn Anas, who was in Medina. And Imam al-Shafi'i, he, he was not just happy with just becoming a mufti. He was happy, of course, but he wanted to learn even more. He wanted to learn from the greatest of the scholars of the religion of Islam of that time. So Imam al-Shafi'i, even having become a mufti, he memorized the book of Imam Malik. Imam Malik's most famous book is al muwatta a collection of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu to do with fiqh, as well as sayings of the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the greatest of the scholars before that time. Imam al-Shafi, he memorized according to some scholars, he memorized the whole of the Muwatta while he was in Mecca. And according to some of the scholars, he memorized most of the book, not all of the book. In any case, having memorized all or most of that book of Imam Malik, he then went out to Medina to learn from the greatest scholar of that time. But he also took a letter of recommendation from the governor of Medina, bearing testimony to the greatness of Imam al-Shafi. With, with that, Imam al-Shafi, went on about the age of 23 or so. He went on to Medina and he sat in the gatherings of Imam Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah. By that time, Imam Malik was in his 70s. He was in his 70s and one of the greatest scholars of the Muslim Ummah by that time. And then Imam al-Shafi, very soon, Imam Malik noticed the greatness of Imam Malik, of Imam al-Shafi. Imam al-Shafi recited the book Muwatta of Imam Malik. He recited to Imam Malik from his memory. Not only that, from his gatherings, he was one of the sharpest and most intelligent of the students of Imam Malik to the extent that Imam al-Shafi became so close to Imam Malik that the little boy al-Shafi, who by that time was an adolescent, he went on to become such a close student of Imam Malik that he was known amongst the Muslim world later on as being one of the leading students of Imam Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah. After that, in 179 Hijri, Imam Malik died. By that time, Imam, Ma Imam al-Shafi'i Imam al-Shafi in his 20s, he had acquired the knowledge of Sufyan ibn Uyayna and others in Mecca. He acquired the knowledge of the great Imam Malik as well as the other scholars of Medina and sometimes going out of Medina to learn from other scholars and coming back. When Imam Malik died in 179 Hijri, Imam al-Shafi by that time, he had grown with knowledge upon knowledge and then he went on and traveled to learn from other scholars of Islam elsewhere in the Muslim world. After that, Imam al-Shafi, he traveled all the way to Yemen, where his mom came from. He traveled to Yemen and he learned from some of the best scholars of Yemen of that time. Then he traveled to, amongst other countries he traveled, he traveled to Iraq, he traveled to Baghdad, he traveled to other cities of Iraq. And remember, Baghdad was the center of Islam. It was the capital city of Islam of that time. 
So he traveled and learned from the greatest of scholars. Later on, he traveled to Egypt and he learned from the scholars there. With all these scholars and their knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Imam al-Shafi'i with the knowledge of Islam and with the keenness that he gave to him and the natural gifts that Allah gave to Imam al-Shafi'i, he prepared him to be that second mujaddid of Islam. Let us appreciate the work that Imam al-Shafi'i did that made him the second mujaddid in the history of Islam, that Imam Ahmed bore testimony as well as the Muslim scholars bear testimony to his greatness of Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. At that time, for us to appreciate the, the brilliance of Imam al-Shafi'i, the greatness of Imam al-Shafi'i, the great protection and care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the, to the Ummah of Islam, let us look at the situation of the Muslim world at that time. At that time, by that time, in Iraq, the Muslims developed a tendency towards being Ahlul Ra'i, the people of opinions. Whereas in Medina and that area, the Muslims were developing a tendency to be the people of Ahlul Hadith, to be the people of the Hadith. In Iraq, there was a movement that was developing, not out of necessarily out of conscious efforts, but Iraq, remember, the cities of Kufa and Basra, there were cities that were formed by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu when he was Khalifa. When Umar radiallahu anhu was Khalifa between 13 Hijri, between 13 Hijri, and after that, for 10, 10 years, Umar he formed the city of Basra and Kufa, in, and there settled the soldiers of the, of the Muslims. And amongst them were some people who came as soldiers, they were new Muslims. They knew very little about Islam. And as I mentioned this earlier as well, amongst these people, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ was a bit hard to find. Amongst them were a lot of, lot of bid'ah, and movements against Islam that were developing because that was on the outskirts of Islam it was filled with soldiers and others and some great scholars as well who went there for being for doing jihad but there were these other type of people too and in that atmosphere where the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ was a bit rare to find with authentic chains in that atmosphere the people, they were developing a tendency where instead, given that the hadith was not easy to find, they would start to give their fatwa, they would start to give their opinions just based on their understanding. And sometimes it had very little connection to the Quran, very little connection to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. At that time, as I mentioned earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, sent Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Imam Abu Hanifa stuck to the Quran, he stuck to the best of the hadith that he could find, and he, he, he was one of the most brilliant of the Imams of all time. But after Imam Abu Hanifa, some of the other people that were there, they were developing a tendency where they would just give a fatwa, not necessarily based on hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, or even so, maybe on some understanding of Islam that was not from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, or not close to the hadith. These were the Ahlul Ra'i, the people of the opinion that were developing in, in Iraq and in that area. Then, so to speak, as a reaction to that, in Medina, you had some people who were developing, seeing that the people of Iraq were so away from the Hadith, the people of Medina, Medina was the home of the Prophet ﷺ. They stuck on, they stuck on to the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is great. But when faced with the challenge of the people of the opinion, these people in Medina, these people in Medina, they took refuge. They took refuge in the opinions and verdicts of the greatest of the scholars of hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. By that time, that was Imam Malik rahimahullah. So the people of Medina by that time, they would be sticking so close to the hadith, but afraid of the opinions, they might be sticking on to opinions of maybe some other scholars to such an extent that they might be afraid. They might be afraid of exercising their judgment when there was no clear hadith in the matter. So you had the Ahlul Ra'i on one hand, then you had the other people on the other hand who were afraid to venture when there was no hadith into exercising Qiyas and other things such as that. In this atmosphere, when there were two camps developing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought about Imam al-Shafi'i to combine these two camps, bring them back together such that the Muslim world, instead of being split apart, it was brought together by Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. And let us see how. We notice that in the Christianity, we notice in the Christian world, they left the guidance of the Prophet Isa alayhi salam before, and then they just went about by saying that religion is just spirit. Religion is just spirit, not the letter of the law. 
but it is just spirit. This is what the Ahlul Ra'i would have ended up in. Whereas the people of Medina and that area, they would have ended up as the people of the Jewish people descendant ended up, where they had the guidance of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, but over a period of time, they just stuck on to the letter of it so much that they forgot what was the purpose of it, and they did not follow the message of it, but more so the letter of what the law was only. It was at that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Imam al-Shafi'i to come to save Islam from going to that extreme or to that extreme. It, how did he do that? We saw already his upbringing, which made him such a great scholar of Islam at that time. Then, when Imam al-Shafi'i was still young, but a renowned scholar, one of the greatest scholars of that time, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi rahimahullah, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi rahimahullah, he, he asked Imam al-Shafi'i, he asked Imam al-Shafi'i to write a book. Given all the problems that were there, to write a book that would combine these two camps instead of deviating apart to bring them together onto the Quran and Sunnah. So he asked Imam al-Shafi'i to write a book that will show to the Muslims, that will show to the Muslim scholars the principles of how to understand the Quran and how to deduce commands from the Quran. A book that will show to them how to understand the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and how to stick to the Sunnah and derive commands. And the ijma, the consensus, as well as the nasikh and mansukh, the abrogation and so on. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he responded to this request from the great scholar Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi. Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi was a great scholar of hadith. But despite all his knowledge, he felt that he was not up to this challenge. So he asked this whiz kid, he asked his great scholar, Imam al-Shafi'i, who had the knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah, but had a great mind as well, an intelligent mind. He asked him to write that book. He sent a letter to Imam al-Shafi'i and Imam al-Shafi'i responded with a letter to Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi's request and that book became known as a risala A risala simply means a message that is sent. It was known as a risala but that book of Imam al-Shafi'i became a turning point. When the Muslims were deviating, it turned them back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and that book was one of the greatest favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala onto the Muslim ummah. With that book, Al-Risala, Imam al-Shafi, he, he went to the people of Ra'i and he debated with them, he argued with them. In fact, I actually forgot to mention, after learning from Imam Malik, rahimahullah, Imam al-Shafi went to Yemen and eventually he went to Baghdad. And there in Baghdad, Imam al-Shafi learned from the leading student, from one of the two leading students of Imam Abu Hanifa, and that is Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah. Muhammad ibn Hassan was the Qadi. He was the Qadi in the Abbasid Empire, and he was in Baghdad, the judge. And Imam al-Shafi, when he was there, he, sa he settled down with Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, the great student of Imam Abu Hanifa, and he learned from him the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Imam al-Shafi, see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made him go to Medina, and learn the fiqh of Imam Malik. He made him go to Baghdad and learn the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa from his leading student, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, because Imam Abu Hanifa was dead by that time. Having learned these, Imam al-Shafi'i, from that great ability that Allah gave him and the knowledge, he started to debate with the scholars of Islam at that time. He started to debate with them wherever he went. In fact, Imam al-Shafi'i even would debate with Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani about some aspect to do with Ra'i and opinion and Qiyas and so on. Imam al-Shafi'i, he went on with the brilliance that Allah gave him and the knowledge. He went on to debate with the scholars of the Muslim world, east and west and center and everywhere. He traveled everywhere. He debated with the people of opinion in Iraq and he debated with the people who would stick very much without any of the Qiyas, so to speak. Elsewhere, he would debate with both of these camps and show to them the principles that he wrote in his book, al risala and he would bring this camp away from opinion towards the Sunnah and to the Quran, and he would bring the other camp away from leaving the Qiyas towards coming into Quran, Sunnah, as well as understanding of the Quran and Sunnah as well. With this, Imam al-Shafi'i, he brought the Muslim Ummah that was deviating into two camps back into the one camp. And in terms of fiqh, in terms of fiqh, he wrote that book, Al-Risala, which, which became, which became 
In, in terms of the books of Usul al-Fiqh, the book of Imam al-Shafi'i al-Risala, it became the father of the books of Usul al-Fiqh. Before Imam al-Shafi'i, the Sahaba and Tabi'een, they knew Usul al-Fiqh better than Imam al-Shafi'i did. But they did not write a book about it. But Imam al-Shafi'i wrote a book so that the scholars around the world, they can read that. And to this day, we have the book al risala of Imam al-Shafi'i that we benefit until this day. He wrote it before 200 Hijri, and now in 1430 Hijri, we still benefit from the book of Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah. With this book, when he wrote it, Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, he was so amazed with the incredible intelligence and knowledge of Imam Shafi'i that he would say, he would say that in every prayer, he would keep doing dua from Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. In every prayer, he would do dua for Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah because of the great service he was doing to Islam as they lived at that time. This was one of the great achievements of Imam a Shafi'i that he brought in fiqh, he brought the two opposing camps onto the Quran and the Sunnah to the extent that to this day, to this day, we are dependent and reliant on the book Ar-Risala of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. But this was in the matter of fiqh. In the matter of beliefs of the Muslims, Imam Shafi'i did an equally great task as well. And let us look at that as well. Imam al-Shafi, as I said, was born in 150 Hijri, died in 204 Hijri. A short life he lived. But by that time, by that time, the Muslim world had expanded. The Muslim world had expanded into areas that had the learning of the Greeks, the Persians. And as a result, the, when the Muslim world expanded there, the Muslims started to learn from some of the knowledge of, of the world of the Greeks and the Persians. And this was good on one hand, that the Muslims learned the medicine, the mathematics, the science that the Persians had, that the Greeks had, and that even later on that the Indians and others had. The Muslims learned this, they translated this into Arabic, and then they became the leading scientists, the leading inventors of the world for more than a thousand years thereafter. More than a thousand years thereafter. This movement started to a large scale. On a large scale, it started at the time of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, he died in about 158 Hijri. During his lifetime and his time as the Khalifa, he translated the books of the Greeks and others into Arabic. So the Muslims, they learned this and they became the leaders in that thereafter. But unfortunately, some of the Muslims, they also learned the things from the Greeks that they should not have learned. That was the philosophy of the Greeks. The philosophy of the Greeks, of Aristotle, of Socrates, Plato, and these other people, the philosophy of the Greeks, the Greeks did not believe in the messengers of God. As a result, they would sit in a room, in a hall, and they would speculate what Allah would be like. And Allah is not like anyone or anything we know. So how can they imagine what Allah is like? As a result, these philosophers, when they spoke about metaphysics, when they spoke about the ghayb, the unknown to do with Allah. When they spoke about that, these philosophers had no idea of the reality. And when the Muslims translated their work into, into Arabic, it would have been proper and better for the Muslims to completely leave the work of these philosophers to do with the ghayb and instead to turn to the messenger of Allah who learned this from the angel of Allah who brought the knowledge of the hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Instead of doing this, there were some of the Muslims who learned the, this philosophy from the, the Greek philosophy and, and others. They learned this and they developed a field of study that was known as Ilm al-Kalam. They developed a field of study known as Ilm al-Kalam. They, they started to rely a lot on the Greek philosophers. And they became so amazed with them, some of the Muslims, so amazed with them that they thought, if you want to be the intellectual, academic, leading person, you need to know the Greek philosophy. That is what they thought incorrectly. That was wrong, because Greek philosophy was about the ghayb, the hidden, and they had no need to learn any of that. But they learned that, and some of the Muslims, they thought, if you want to be cool, you want to be academic, you want to be known as the intelligentsia, then you need to know the philosophy of these people. So the Muslim world was deviating on that path, and the sect called Mu'tazila appeared amongst the Muslims at that time. The Mu'tazila, they would learn the Greek philosophy 
And they would, be, they would have such an inferiority complex with the Greek philosophy that whatever of the Qur'an or Sunnah that the Mu'tazila could not understand from a philosophical, Greek philosophical way, they would start to reject whatever was from the Qur'an and Sunnah. They would say that yes, we believe in the word, but we reject every meaning of what is there in the Qur'an and Sunnah. This is how the Mu'tazila came. They had an inferiority complex. They thought they were intelligent, but they were far from it. They did not have enough intelligence to realize that philosophy was to do about the hidden and nothing and that was not something we turn to instead we turn to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam anyway to cut it short this mu'tazila they started to gain a momentum with ilmul kalam imam al-shafi rahimahullah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the great knowledge and intelligence that he gave him he matched the intelligence of the Mu'tazila and he simply would say to the people he would simply say to the people that this Ilmul Kalam this Ilmul Kalam it has nothing to benefit for the Muslims it has nothing to benefit for the Muslims and Imam Shafi'i showed to the people and he even gave his verdicts and his opinion to the people that whoever he said my opinion about the people of Ilmul Kalam is that they should be they should be paraded in front of the people and lashed with the, with the date palm leaf branches and etc etc with this Imam Shafi'i let the people be known let, let it be known to the people that this Ilmul Kalam it was not intelligent this Ilmul Kalam was not a status symbol rather it was taking you away but this is not where it ended Imam Shafi'i this work that he started against Ilmul Kalam it, it came to its completion after Imam Shafi rahimahullah with two of his leading students. By the time of Imam Shafi, the Mu'tazila were great gaining power. But just after the death of Imam Shafi, Imam Shafi died in 214 Hijri, and in 218 Hijri, Al Ma'mun, the Khalifa of the Muslim world, he declared that he believed in the belief of the Mu'tazila, and he was forcing the Muslim scholars to turn away from the way of the Quran and Sunnah and to adopt the belief of the Mu'tazila. By that time, Imam Shafi had died. But the movement that Imam Shafi'i started was continued with two of his leading students. One was Al Buwaiti. And Al Buwaiti was one of the top scholars, top students of Imam Shafi'i. And Al Buwaiti was one of the top scholars who led, who led the who led the resistance against the Mu'tazila at the time of Ma'mun and then the two Khalifa after him to the extent that al Buwaiti, the student of Imam al-Shafi, he died in the prison of the Khalifa due to his not accepting the wrong things and so on. But not only that, the work that the Mujaddid Imam al-Shafi began against Ilm al-Kalam, it was brought to his completion by one of the students of Imam al-Shafi, one of the greatest scholars of Islam of all time, that was Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, the fourth of the four great Imams of Fiqh. And the great work that Imam, Sh Imam Ahmed did, which was unparalleled in history, except for a few other occasions, that work we will look at next time when we look at the biography of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah. But this was the work that Imam Shafi started and his leading students completed immediately after him with having brought the Muslims in Fiqh to the Quran and Sunnah and having brought Muslims towards the Quran and Sunnah even in their belief Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah he brought the Muslims to the religion of Allah such that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah he said he was the second mujaddid in the history of Islam just to appreciate the greatness and brilliance of Imam al-Shafi the scholars would say that Imam al-Shafi he, um, he had an intelligence and a means of articulating his ideas and debating. He was so good at that, such that they would say that if you asked, if Imam Shafi was to debate with you, to argue with you that this piece of wood is actually gold, he was so good at debating and so intelligent and so knowledgeable that he could argue with you and make you convinced and he would persuade you that this wood, it is actually gold. That this wood, it, that you are looking with your eyes, that it is actually gold. This is how Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah was. All of this, can you see my dear brothers and sisters? 
This brilliance of Imam Shafi'i was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gave him this great mind and then Allah opened up the doors for him to learn from the best scholars of Mecca, then to learn from the best scholars of Medina, the greatest scholars of Islam of that time, then from the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa in Baghdad and in Egypt and elsewhere. All of this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made available to Imam al-Shafi'i. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who brought up this mujaddid at a time when if this mujaddid was not there, sent by Allah, then the Muslim ummah would have split up. And this, and this, my dear brothers and sisters, this, it fills us with that confidence. It fills us with that inspiration that we should continue we should continue to benefit from the merciful guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Islam, which is the Sharia, which is the Quran and the Sunnah. We should continue to follow that because, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always, will always bring people like the great Imam al-Shafi'i, like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz before, they will come and they will meet the challenges of their time. They will meet the challenges of their time, no matter how strong those challenges might be, no matter how global those challenges might be, because at the time of Imam al-Shafi'i, that challenge spread right across the Muslim world, all the way from Europe, Spain in Europe, down to North Africa, down to the Middle East, to Central Asia, all the way to India. The challenge spread right across, but Allah brought a man who brought everyone back and championed the cause of the merciful guidance of Allah, of the Quran and of the Sunnah. This was Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Allah did this in the past and Allah will continue to do this at all times. It is up to us, my dear brothers and sisters, it is up to us it is up to us to make that firm determination that our goal is to be either like Imam al-Shafi'i and if we can't, then at least to support those scholars of Islam who are following the Qur'an and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu the way Imam al-Shafi'i did. At least, if you can't be like him, then at least support scholars like that in our time. And even if you couldn't do that, at least speak well of them in your gatherings and defend them, speak well of them and promote them. And lastly, to learn from them, to follow their guidance, to implement it in your life. At least even if others are before the time of the Mujaddid, at least you could be following these great scholars and benefiting from their knowledge and you can answer positively on the day of judgment. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done for the Muslim ummah at all times. It is for us, my dear brothers, it is for us to benefit and to benefit others. And to do that, to do that, we need to remember, to do that, we need to remember, we were not born with the knowledge of Islam. Allah sent the, the angel Jibreel alayhi salam with the message of Islam. Allah sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah sent this message for us to learn that message. In our time, we have cars. We have cars that can go up to 100 kilometers an hour, even more than that. It is up to us to take one hour, two hours, once in, once in the month, maybe two hours is our gathering here. This is the time that we ought to take out. Come ourselves, bring our children. These children may well be the Imam al-Shafi'i of the future, but it is up to us to bring them and to come ourselves. It is up, up to us to put some time to learn the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion, to be inspired emotionally and to be guided intellectually. It is up to us to do this. With this, I want to finish the part one of this. Part one of this, we will come back after this for a short part, second part, where we will look at the simplicity of the great life of Imam al-Shafi'i, his piety, his simplicity, and some of his wise sayings that we can benefit from. Until now, we looked at the effect that Imam al-Shafi'i the Mujaddid had. After about a five minutes break, after a five minutes break, I would like us to come back for maybe another 20 minutes or 25 minutes to look at some of the great sayings of Imam al-Shafi'i. These sayings, they are sayings of wisdom from a wise scholar, a mujaddid of Islam. So we'll be back in five minutes, inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khair. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. In the second part, 
we'll look at some of the sayings of great Imam Ahmed, of great Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, not just sayings about his life, how an Imam lived his life and some of the great aspects of his life. That's what inshallah I'd like to have a look at. And these things, some of the sayings of Imam Shafi'i are from a whole life of knowledge and understanding of Islam. The way he's, he led his life is also from his fear of Allah, his piety, his devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So us reflecting on his sayings and the way he led his life, it helps us a great deal to try to be a bit like those Imams from the past and to learn from their knowledge. Let us begin. These are just some miscellaneous sayings to do with various matters that I'd like to read out from what I have gathered from different books and then we'll reflect on these sayings briefly, otherwise we won't have time. I won't go through all the sayings of God, but some of the sayings of God, inshallah. The first, as we begin, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he urges the Muslims to learn the knowledge. And in, do, in so doing, he says, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, uh, his student Rabia relates, that Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah said, Talabul ilm afdal min salat al-nafila. Imam al-Shafi'i said that the seeking of knowledge of Islam, it is better than the nafil prayer you may be doing. This shows to us that praying nafil prayer is very good. After the compulsory prayer, you pray the sunnah extra prayer and extra nafil prayer. So praying nafil prayer is a good thing. It's very rewarding. But Imam Shafi is saying that is good, that is rewarding, but seeking the knowledge of Allah's religion, it is even better, it is even more important, it is even more appreciated in Islam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it shows to us that the seeking of knowledge, it is very important, especially at the younger age and even at any time during the rest of our life. The knowledge of Allah's religion, it can give us it can make us feel that satisfaction and happiness in our lives, in our hearts, and it also gives us the guidance so we can lead a life that is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of a life that is following the guidance of advertisers, of money-making people, and other people such as that. So Imam Shafi said that seeking of the knowledge is better than even the prayer of nafil, extra prayer. And Imam al-Shafi'i would also say to some of the Ashab al-Hadith, he would say, Qala Shafi'i li ba'di Ashab al-Hadith, Antum as-Sayadila wa nahnu al-Atibba. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah would say to some of the scholars of Hadith who were specialists in Hadith, he would say, you are, the, you are like the pharmacist who dispatch the medicine, who give the medicines to the people, whereas we are doctors. We are doctors. Because the, the scholars who are experts in Hadith they're the ones who memorize the hadith, understand what is authentic and not authentic, etc. And they're the ones who are collecting the hadith and giving it to you. They're like the pharmacist who gives you the medicine that will give you the healing and give you the cure from your disease with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the scholars of the hadith, they're giving us a hadith that is like the medicine. And then Imam al-Shafi said, وَنَحْنُ الْأَطِبَّا We, the scholars of the fiqh, we are doctors. We, the scholars of fiqh, we are doctors. Meaning, it is good to have the medicine, but you need to know what to use the medication for. Otherwise, you might use the medication for one disease to cure another disease and you might end up killing a person. So you need the understanding of the hadith, and that is the fuqaha, that is the scholars of fiqh, who learn the hadith and they explain the hadith. Remember the people of hadith in those days, it meant people who traveled even more extensively to collect the hadith. Whereas a scholar of fiqh has to know the hadith and then know the understanding as well. It's not that you can be a faqih not knowing any hadith. No, you know the hadith but, and then you have the understanding of it. And this shows to us the importance. Firstly, we have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, but also we need to have the understanding of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and it is that which cures them to combine together, cures our diseases of the heart and so on. Let's look now at the simplicity of the life of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Just quickly some of the issues here, some of the points we learn. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah at one time, at one time seeking the knowledge of Islam, he was so short of money, he was so short of money that he had to even sell, he had to even sell the jewelry of his daughter and of his wife. Meaning his daughter and his wife even came forth to sell the jewelry in order to support their husband their father, their father's quest for knowledge and their father's spreading of the knowledge of Allah's religion that he 
instead of working to become rich he spent time in this as well and this i hope we realize and appreciate ourselves that we shouldn't get so involved in the dunya that we forget about our religion we should learn the religion and we, we should learn the religion as well as acquire the dunya but not forgetting one at the expense of the other another thing about imam shafi rahimahullah his student Rabi related that he said, I heard Chef A say, I did not eat satiated since 16 years, except for once. So on that occasion, I entered my hand and vomited. Imam Shafi said he didn't want to live for the sake of the pleasure of the dunya. As a little, as a result, he would eat only enough to keep himself in a good health. On one occasion, therefore, for 16 years, he never filled his stomach. He never ate for the sake of eating. Therefore, on one occasion, when he did eat too much, he said he put his fingers inside his mouth and he vomited it out because he did not want to live this life for the sake of this life and his pleasure. Instead, he wanted to take from the life that which will keep him healthy to do good deeds for the eternal life. Imam Shafi, also on one occasion, his student said, he, Imam Shafi was passing by shoemakers. His whip fell down on the ground. It seems he was on a ride on an animal. His whip fell down to the ground and immediately a boy came forth, wiped the whip with his sleeves. A boy came forth, wiped the whip with his sleeves and gave it to Imam Shafi. So Imam Shafi gave the boy seven gold coins, seven dinar. This shows the generosity of Imam Shafi rahimahullah because that boy owed nothing to Imam Shafi but out of his niceness the boy when he saw the whip of Imam Shafi fall down instead of Imam Shafi coming down the boy raced got the whip cleaned it with his own sleeves and gave it to him Imam Shafi loved this action so much and from his humility so that he doesn't feel like he's a king or anything from his humility he rewarded the boy by giving him seven dinar, seven gold coins, subhanAllah. This was how generous he was. He wasn't afraid of becoming poor, etc. Another time his student Rabi said, his student Rabi said, I got married. So Shafi asked me, how much mahar did you give her? How much sadaq did you give her? I said, 30 dinar, 30 gold coins, six up front, the rest later. So he gave me the remaining 24 dinar. Meaning the student of Imam Shafi Rabi, he was a student of knowledge, a talib al-ilm. He didn't have time to go and become rich. So when he got married, he got married with a mahar of 30 dinar, 30 gold coin. He only had six to give up front to the, to the girl he got married to. And with an understanding that the remaining 24 dinar gold coins, he will give later. So Imam Shafi, appreciating how his student is spending the time in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to acquire the knowledge of Islam in order not to make it hard for him and to turn him away from the knowledge of Islam Imam Shafi gave him 24 gold coins 24 dinar of his own money to encourage him and keep him going on the way of Allah seeking the knowledge of Allah's religion again <coughs> This shows to us that we ought to be helping those who are seeking the knowledge of Islam. We ought to be giving money to those who are coming to seek the knowledge of Islam. They might not be able to become rich. Or they are teaching the knowledge to give money in order for them to teach knowledge. So for example, Imam, for example, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he was one of the greatest scholars in Saudi Arabia. And a lot of rich people would give him lots and lots of money. And he would take that money, build buildings and have students from all around the world staying there and learning and he would give them their clothes, their food, their expenses, their books and everything. So you see how we ought to support this, whether you're a businessman or just a worker, give some money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Imam Shafi rahimahullah himself did. And Humaydi, one of the greatest scholars of hadith said, he said Shafi came to Sana'a, which is in Yemen, a tent was pitched for him, he had 10,000 dinar. Some people came and asked him, meaning they asked him to give him something, the tent was not removed except that nothing of that 10,000 was remaining with him. 10,000 gold coins. This is how generous Imam Shafi rahimahullah was. He had 10,000 dinar, people asked him, he gave it to them. Because he knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would look after him. Just let's look at some of his other sayings, etc. Imam Shafi rahimahullah would say, the knowledge is of two types. The knowledge is of two types. Knowledge of religion, and that is the fiqh. 
and knowledge of the dunya, meaning the world, and that is the medicine. All else beside these, whether it be poetry or anything else, it is toil and frivolity playing around in vain. So he said knowledge is two types. Of the deen, it is the fiqh, meaning knowing the hadith and the Quran and gaining its understanding. That is one type of knowledge. The other one is the knowledge of medicine. Meaning in those days, knowledge of medicine was the one that would help you to have a worldly life where in a worldly life you could live in a healthy manner. So the knowledge of the medicine would help you to be able to live in this life so you could go, so you could live for the hereafter. In those days, that was what medicine was. So from that we understand that even in our time today, any knowledge that will help us for our dunya, to be able to live in the dunya, to live as good Muslims, that knowledge is good. Apart from that, it is a waste of time, it is frivol frivolity and a waste. Imam al-Shafi also said in another, another saying, he said, <clears throat> he said, إِذَا خِفْتَ عَلَىٰ عَمَلِكَ الْعُجْبَ He said, if you are afraid of being impressed by your own good deeds, if you're afraid of being impressed by your own good deeds, فَذْكُرْ رِضَىٰ مَنْ تَطْلُبْ وَفِي أَيِّ نَعِيمٍ تَرْغَبْ وَفِي أَيِّ عِقَابٍ تَرْهَبْ وَفَمَنْ فَكَّرَ فِي ذَلِكَ سَغُرَ عَنْدَهُ عَمَلُهُ He said, if you're afraid that your good deeds will become, you'll be so impressed, man, I'm doing so good. If you're so impressed about that, he said, remember the, remember the one whose pleasure you are seeking, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the bliss that you desire, meaning the paradise that you're desiring, and the punishment which you are afraid of and you dread. So whoever reflects on that, his deeds become small in his sight, and meaning his good actions become small and he himself becomes humble. When he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his greatness, the paradise and how much is required to get there, the hellfire and how difficult it is to avoid it, you realize that my actions are so small in front of all of that. And also Abu Zur'a al-Razi, one of the greatest scholars, he related that Qutaybah ibn Sa'id rahimahullah said, Imam al died and with him died the piety. Shafi'i died and with him the Sunan and Ahmad is dying and Bid'ah is appearing. This shows the importance of Imam al-Shafi'i, what he did in his life to preserve the Sunnah of the Prophet and Imam Ahmad said, Shafi'i was the afsah of the people in Arabic. Imam Shafi'i was the best in Arabic language. As I said, one of the keys, one of the keys to understanding of Islam. And again, as I mentioned before, Imam, actually, one of, one of the students of Imam Shafi'i related that Shafi'i used to say to me, there is no way to safety from people. So look for the one in, in look for the one in whom is your well-being and welfare and stick to him. Subhanallah, this saying it is so intelligent and wise. Imam Shafi'i said, there is no way to having complete safety from people. You're bound to get harmed by someone now and then. So there's no way to have complete safety from people. Given that you're going to be possibly have no safety from every person, every person you might have some sort of harm with. Given that that is the case, then look for the one in whom you stand to benefit and have your welfare of your religion and the dunya and stick to that person. Stick to that person. That's something that is worthwhile for us to reflect upon. Another, one is, another saying is related that an old man came to Imam Shafi'i and he asked Imam Shafi'i about ijma, about consensus. Give me dalil, give me proof from the Quran and Sunnah, from the Quran that ijma is a principle of Islam. What is ijma? Ijma is very important for us to understand in our time today because ijma means, ijma means any ruling of fiqh. Any ruling of Islam where all the scholars of one particular time, they all held the same view, they all had the same fatwa and understanding from the Quran and Sunnah, then that becomes compulsory for everybody to follow for all time. So that is what ijma is and that is important because we don't want people to come today and all the great Imams and Sahaba followed one understanding of Islam and they say I've got a different understanding. That is rubbish. That is rubbish. Because we can only understand Islam if the early Muslims all had a consensus on one thing, we can't come up with something else. Otherwise it would mean all the Muslims before didn't know Islam and here I am now knowing Islam and that is of course not correct. So a man came and asked Imam Shafi to look for an evidence for this. 
from the Quran. So they say Imam Shafi went away for three days. Three days where he read and reflected on the Quran and then he came back mentioning the verse from Surah An-Nisa, verse number 115, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَهُ لَهُ That's a verse in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 115. I'll leave it for you to read. Imam Shafi spent three days. I'll let you go home and spend about 10 minutes to look at that verse inshallah. Imam Ahmad would say that Abu Abdullah al Shafi said, sorry, Imam, Imam Ahmad would say, I did not see anyone more following of the narrations of the Prophet sallam, than al Shafi'i. This shows that Imam al Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he stuck to the narrations and the hadith of the Prophet. Sallam. He wasn't somebody who would just say from his mind, but he would understand what the Prophet sallam, is saying, and that is what he would follow. And what Allah is saying in the Quran as well. And Imam al-Shafi would also say, Imam al-Shafi would also say, it is related that Imam al-Shafi said, Al-Labib al-Aqil huwa al-Fatin al-Mutaghafil. This saying is very short and small, but there is so much to it. He said, Al-Labib al-Aqil, a, a an intelligent, sensible person, a sensible, intelligent person, who is that? He is the prudent person. He is the prudent person, meaning he's sharp and discerning and prudent, but sometimes he pretends as though he didn't understand, he just ignores it. He pretends as though he didn't understand and he ignores it. Meaning, a person who is intelligent and smart and sensible, he knows that sometimes people come and say silly things to you. If you pick a fight with everybody at every time and feel bad about it, then you'll spend your whole life fighting people. So, Imam al-Shafi would say, the sensible, intelligent person, he is the one who, he is intelligent and smart and sharp, but he's mutaghafil. Sometimes he behaves as though he didn't understand. He didn't actually pay attention. That way, someone might come and say something to really hurt you and get at you. You pretend as though you didn't even hear it. The guy would be so frustrated and leave and you've gotten into no trouble. You just move on. So subhanAllah, and there's so much more to that as well. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah would also say, لا يبلغ في هذا الشأن رجل حتى يضر به الفقر ويؤثره على كل شيء. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah say, would say, in this field, meaning in the field of the knowledge of Allah's religion, in becoming a scholar of Allah's religion, in the field of knowledge of Allah's religion, he would say, in this field, no one attains the heights until poverty hurts him and he cherishes and prefers it above all other things. This shows to you that if you want to get higher in the religion of Allah, Allah tries you and tests you with poverty. But if you still prefer the knowledge of Allah's religion, despite the poverty and everything, then Allah will give you that high status and that knowledge as the great scholars as they had in their own time as well. Just going back some of the sayings of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, just one incident it shows to us, one incident of Imam al-Shafi'i, Yunus said, I said to Shafi'i, our companion Laith says, Imam al-Laith says, if, a, if, if I were to see a man of desires and bid'ah walk on water, I would not accept him. Literally he said, if I was to see a man of hawa, I walk on water, I would not accept it. Shafi'i then said, you fell short. If I were to see him walk even in air, I would not accept it. Meaning, he, Imam al-Shafi'i is saying, Imam al laythis companion student said, if I saw a man walk, if I saw a man walk on water, some people would say, oh man, you know, awliya Allah. And whatever he would say, you would follow whatever he would say. Imam al-Shafi'i would say, no, even if I was to see him walk in the air, I would not accept what he would say until it had something from the Qur'an and the Sunnah as its basis. And then Imam al-Shafi'i, let's look at this other incident, how his student al-Muzani became his great student. Muzani said, when al-Shafi'i came to Egypt, when Imam al-Shafi'i visited Egypt, Muzani is saying, I said to myself, if anyone is going to remove that which I have inside me of confusion and doubts about the Mu'tazila belief of Tawheed, then it is him, meaning a Shafi'i. Because Al-Muzani was being a bit confused. The Mu'tazila were using the Greek philosophy, Ilm al-Kalam, to explain the, what Allah is and how Allah is, the Tawheed. 
So Al-Muzani said, I was confused. So when Ash-Shafi, the great scholar was coming to Egypt, Al-Muzani said, if anyone is going to remove this confusion for me, it has got to be this man. So Al-Muzani said, so I spoke to him about the issue and he became upset and angry and asked me. He said, do you know where you are? Remember, where is he? He's in Egypt. He said, do you know where you are? This is the spot where the, where the Fir'aun drowned. This is the spot where Fir'aun drowned. Has it reached you that the Messenger of Allah ordered to ask about that? I said, no. He asked me, so did the Sahaba speak about the Kalam? I said, no. So Muzani then said, he went on, Muzani then went on to become one of the strongest and closest students of Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah. This shows to us that there was confusion even at that time. Like we have confusion today, they had confusion then as well. But Imam al-Shafi is saying, you are in Egypt, the very place where Allah you know, drowned the Fir'aun. While you're there, you want to go to the knowledge of the other people of the Greeks and others to do with the religion, Ghayb. He's saying, did the Prophet ﷺ mention it? No. Did the Sahaba talk about it? No. Then he, you know, he said to him to stick to that. And also they say, there is another saying here as well. Imam al-Shafi would say to his students, he would say that I heard Imam Malik say, a man, the, the narration goes, a man came to Muzani and asked him about something of ilm al-kalam, of the philosophy. Muzani said, I hate this. Moreover, I forbid it as a Shafi used to forbid it. I heard Shafi say, Malik, meaning Imam Malik ibn Anas, I, I heard Shafi saying, Malik was asked about Kalam and Tawheed, meaning Tawheed according to the Mu'tazila. So he, Imam Malik said, it is impossible to think that the Prophet sallallahu taught his ummah how to clean themselves after the toilet and yet he did not teach them about the Tawheed, about Allah, how he is, who he is, what the Mu'tazila are talking about. Whereas Tawheed is, as the Prophet sallallahu said, I have been ordered to battle on with the people until they say there is no deity except Allah. So whatever saves the blood and the wealth is the reality of Tawheed. So this is the way Imam Shafi was, how strong he was towards his student, saying to them to stick to the way of the Prophet Prophet and the companions and not to what was regarded as being intellectual by learning the, the philosophy of the Greeks about the hidden matters. Mind you, Imam Shafi encouraged to learn medicine but not philosophy because philosophy was talking about the ghayb whereas the philosophers had no knowledge about the ghayb. Let's look at Imam Shafi how he was with regards to fatwa. Fatwa is something we all love to give, our, all of us. Meaning when someone asks you, well in the religion, would it be permissible to do this or not? Immediately some amongst us would say, well in my opinion, and then he will say something, it is permissible or not. But then we really ask ourselves, am I qualified to be giving a fatwa? And we really ask ourselves, what if I was wrong and I'm not qualified? I may imagine the sin I would get from Allah in, a, in the day of judgment. So Imam Shafi is saying, Yunus said, I heard Shafi say, I did not see anyone stronger in fiqh than Sufyan ibn Uyayna, nor anyone more quiet and silent in issuing fatwa than him. Subhanallah. Appreciate this. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Imam Shafi is saying, I didn't see anyone stronger in understanding and fiqh than Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Yet, I didn't see anyone more afraid, more quiet in giving fatwa than Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah. So it shows that the more knowledge you have, the more afraid you are of giving fatwa. And that is how we ought to be. With our little knowledge, we shouldn't be racing to be giving a fatwa when we don't know the answer. Otherwise, you see, Subhanallah. One company comes up with a product of maybe buying a house. Then you see people, they send emails, they send messages. Then people come and ask them and they give fatwa. This is halal, this is haram. People look at it as a personal crusade. But subhanallah, if you're not a scholar, if you're not a scholar qualified to give an opinion, then why would you be giving an opinion? Why not leave it to the scholars to talk about it if you are not a scholar yourself? Sure, we love about the religion, we want to protect it. But if you wanted to protect religion, then seek the knowledge first before you start giving the verdicts. And that is what we learn from Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Let us look at another thing incident from Imam al-Shafi'i. Yunus al-Sudafi said, this incident shows when people disagree in Islam, when people disagree that they shouldn't go at each other's throat and become enemies forever. 
So let us look at this. Imam Yunus as Sudafi said, I did not see anyone more intelligent than Shafi'i. I debated him one day about an issue and then we separated. He met me, took me by my hands and then said, Oh Abu Musa, wouldn't it be fitting? Wouldn't it be fitting that we be brothers even when we do not agree in a matter? Subhanallah. Look at the way he was with a person who he disagreed with. He's saying that Yunus, Yunus Sudafi, he's the person that Imam Shafi debated and argued with. Yet Yunus is bearing witness that I did not see anyone more intelligent than Shafi. And after the debate is finished, they disagreed, they debated, they, went there, they were separating and going their own ways. Imam Shafi went to Yunus, he held him by his hands, he held him by his hands, which is to show the affection to show the friendliness. He held him by his hand and he said, Oh Abu Musa, wouldn't it be fitting that we be brothers even when we do not agree in a matter? This is how these scholars were. Even when they disagreed in matters of ijtihad, they were still brothers and not against one another. But remember, this is in matters of ijtihad where the matter is not spelt out and you have to deduce a command. But whereas when the matter is spelt out in the foundations of the religion, that is where you should not have differences and you don't actually respect someone having their own opinion. And this is shown by the next issue where Rabi' said, I heard Shafi being asked about the Qur'an. He replied, Uff, uff, the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. Whoever says it is created has indeed done kufr. Imam al-Dhahabi said in Sirah Alam al-Nubula that his chain of narration is authentic. This shows that there were the Mu'tazila, the people of Bid'ah, they were propagating a Bid'ah belief that the Qur'an is created. That is not a matter of ijtihad. That is going clearly against the Quran and Sunnah. In those fundamental issues, Imam Shafi'i was not talking about, oh look, that's your opinion, my opinion, no problem, we're all brothers. In that, in such a matter, Imam Shafi'i, he said, Uff, uff, the Quran is the speech of Allah. Whoever says it is created has indeed done kufr, has done disbelief. So that was not a matter to be just having, you know, ijtihad and so on. It shows to us the difference between an ijtihad matter and a clean, clear fundamental matter of the religion. Again, Imam Shafi'i said about bid'ah, he would say for a slave to meet Allah with every sin besides shirk is better for him than to meet Allah with ahwa, than to meet him with ahwa, to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with bid'ah. Some bid'ah which crosses the boundary Rabi' said, I heard Shafi, and actually as I just mentioned, that was a bid'ah of Khalq al-Qur'an which was outside Islam and he condemned it so strongly. And then let's look at this other narration about Imam Shafi warning about the distorted beliefs and so on. Abdullah ibn, Sa Abdullah ibn Salih, a companion of Imam al-Layth said, see these things are important because sometimes we might not realize that if we were not, if we were not protecting the religion against bid'ah, etc., we might think that oh, it's not a big deal, everybody has his own opinion. No, people can have an, scholars can have an opinion about matters of istihad, but not about the fundamentals of the religion that are clear, otherwise you wouldn't recognize Islam today with everybody distorting the fundamentals. So let's look at this incident. Abdullah ibn Saleh, the companion of Imam al-Layth said, we were with Shafi in his gathering and he started speaking about affirming a narration from a single chain from the Prophet so he, so we we wrote it down. We went with him to Ibrahim ibn Ulayya. Ibrahim was a major figure of the Jahmiyyah misguided sect at that time. Whereas his father Ismail was an Imam and Shaykh of the scholars of Hadith. Ibrahim was one of the youth of Abu Bakr al Assam, and Ibrahim was in his gathering at the door of, of at the door. When we recited to him, he started to argue. When we recited to him, he started to argue, to refute it. So we wrote down what he said. We went with it to a Shafi'i, whereupon Shafi'i refuted it and showed the flaw in it. We wrote it down. Basically, this whole incident, at the end of it, Imam Shafi'i is saying, indeed, Ibrahim ibn Ulayya is a misguided person. He sat by the door of misguided people, thereby misguiding the others, misguiding them. This saying, just cutting it short, people would learn from the Ibrahim ibn Ulayya who was a person of bid'ah, then they would come and ask Imam Shafi'i, then go and ask him, then ask Imam Shafi'i. Eventually Imam Shafi'i said clearly, he said, indeed Ibrahim ibn Ulayya, he's a misguided person. He sat by the door of misguided people, 
thereby misguiding them. So this shows to us that sometimes when people were distorting the guidance of Allah, Imam Shafi spoke out against that. He was not quiet about things such as that. Rabi said that Shafi spoke to Hafs al-Fard and Hafs said, Quran is created. So Shafi said to him, you have done kufr of Allah, the, the Supreme. Again, all of this shows how Imam Shafi wanted to protect the religion of Allah. Look at this, Buwaiti, Buwaiti, the leading scholar of Imam Shafi, he said, I asked a Shafi, can I pray behind a Rafidi? A Rafidi meaning an extreme sect of the Shia. He said, can I pray behind a Rafidi? A Shafi answered, do not, do not pray behind a Rafidi, Qadari or Murji'i. So this shows how Imam Shafi was so careful about the religion in its fundamentals not being distorted as related in Seer Alam and Nubula of Imam al dhahabi These are just maybe a couple of other sayings before we finish. Imam Shafi also said about Ilm al-Kalam, about the philosophy, he said if people knew the Ahwa, meaning the Bid'ah, that are in Kalam, the Ilm al-Kalam, they would run to escape from it as they run to escape from a lion. He's discouraging the people of getting involved in those things. Abdullah ibn Hakam said, Shafi used to dislike Kalam after he debated with Hafs, a person of Kalam. He used to say, by Allah, for a scholar to have said to him after a fatwa that the scholar has made a mistake is better for him than to speak about Ilm al-Kalam and be called a heretic. There is nothing more despised by Allah than Ilm al-Kalam and its people. People, meaning the philosophy and his people. Maybe just a couple more things before we finish. We show the cleverness of Imam Shafi rahimahullah. A man came to Muzani and asked him about something of Kalam. Actually, I mentioned this about Imam Malik before. A man came to Muzani and asked him something about Kalam. And Muzani said, I hate this. Moreover, I forbid it as Shafi used to forbid it. I, I heard Shafi said, Malik was asked about Kalam and Tawheed. So... Malik said, it is impossible to think that the Prophet taught his ummah about istinja, cleaning yourself after the toilet, and yet he did not teach them tawheed. Whereas tawheed is, the, is, the, tawheed is as the Prophet ﷺ said, I have been ordered to battle on with the people until they say there is no deity except Allah. So whatever saves the blood and wealth is, is, the, is the reality of tawheed. All of this shows about Imam Shafi, how he stuck to preserve the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from going away. The last thing I want to mention is about the matters of fiqh. Even in the matters of fiqh, Imam Shafi encouraged the people to follow the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and not to do taqlid. When we talk about taqlid, meaning if you're a scholar, you're not blindly following another scholar, but you're learning from the Quran and the Sunnah. And let us look at what Imam Shafi said about this before we finish. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal mentioned that Imam Shafi said, Imam Shafi said to Imam Ahmad, you are the most knowledgeable. You are more knowledgeable than us about authentic reports of the Prophet. So if there is an authentic narration, inform me so that I go to it, so that I go to it and that is my madhab, regardless of whether that narration is from Kufa, Basra or Sham. This shows how Imam Shafi, he relied upon the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, not on anything else apart from that. Another thing, Imam Shafi said, if I see a person from amongst the people of hadith, it is as though I've seen a man from amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah rewarded them with good, for verily they preserve for us the foundation, and so they have the superiority above us. Because the hadith is the foundation of the religion, and that is what these people had preserved. Imam Shafi said also about the people of hadith, he said, actually I mentioned that, that you are the pharmacists and we are the doctors, and so on. And Imam Shafi said, everything I said, if there was something of that which is authentic from the Messenger of Allah, different to my saying, then it is more befitting to be followed. Do not do my blind following without checking its basis in the Quran and the Hadith. Sorry, he said, do not do my taqlid. He said, do not do my taqlid, meaning do not blindly follow me without checking its basis from there. And there are other sayings of Imam Shafi. Humaydi said that one day Shafi related a hadith to him. So Humaydi said to him, you are going to act by that hadith? So Imam Shafi said, did you see me coming out of a church or wearing a waist belt? Such that if I heard from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa a hadith, and I do not say according to it. So this shows how Imam Shafi rahimahullah, he, stood, he lived by the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and by the Quran. He learned it, he championed its cause, he became one of the greatest scholars in the history of Islam. 
to the extent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him with his ikhlas, with his effort, Allah chose him to become the second mujaddid in the history of Islam. Allah did this in the past and inshallah Allah will continue to do this in the future. You, the youngsters of Islam, it is up to you to learn the knowledge of this religion. You, the fathers of the Muslim kids and mothers of Muslim kids, it is up to you to raise your children to be learning this knowledge of Allah's religion so that they could go on to do the great works that Imam al-Shafi'i and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and others did before them. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us success in doing all of that and to give us great scholars such as them, to preserve them, to give them reward in this life and in the hereafter and to give make us amongst those who follow them in their ways. Jazakumullah khairan.